All of you in this room know, as David said, we're, we're kind of at a new dawn right now in education policy, particularly in the accountability <coughs> realm. And this is a result of two major shifts. The first is ESSA's shift, the Every Student Succeeds Act, which shifts a lot of power from the federal government back to the states. Um, and a lot of flexibility at the state level in terms of what we measure, how we define student success, and how we support schools that are struggling to meet those, uh, meet those new guidelines. <clears throat> Simultaneously, here in California, the local control funding formula and the corresponding LCAP plans shift that state control down to the local level. In California, we have 58 counties, we have over a thousand school districts, and now all of these places are going to be responsible for collecting measures that reflect what they believe a good school looks like. At the intersection of these two policies, and this is what we'll be spending a lot of time talking about today, is the idea that multiple measures of school performance should be used locally to drive continuous improvement. But undergirding this idea is the related idea that building, that there's a lot of capacity locally that needs to be built so that people can do this well. We're moving from a world where for the past 10 years under NCLB, there's been a strong focus on compliance. There's been a strong focus on the someone else telling our schools and districts what good education looks like and how to fix it if we're not there. And this shift is monumental, and it's a monumental culture shift, and it's a monumental skill shift as well. Luckily, here in California, the core districts have been implementing a system that looks a lot like this, educators using multiple measures that are locally derived to drive school improvement and system improvement. The work of the Core PACE partnership is really designed to leverage this so that we can learn from the experiences within Core, both to help them get better and also to share this learning across the state and across the country. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rick to talk about the work of Core, and then we'll talk about our research findings in the partnership. Great. Thanks, Heather. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here this morning. So I'm going to talk uh, relatively briefly about who we are and a little bit about our accountability system, but I've talked about this well, so I think most people are, have some familiarity, but CORE at its heart is just a collaborative of eight school, large school districts across California. We represent a significant number of kids, over a million kids, teachers, and schools, uh, but really the theory behind our work is that we can learn together. Um, and that uh, rather than districts going to their corner and trying different things and not talking to each other, there ought to be a system in place for us to sort of learn and be part of, uh, part of a collaborative environment. Uh, as you know, probably a few years ago, we um, established, we were given a waiver from No Child Left Behind that allowed us to establish an accountability model, multiple measure accountability model that, um, that uh, sort of Heather talked about. And ours, as you look at, the, these are all, and you probably can't see this, but these are all the different um, things we pay attention to. I have a limited time today, so I'm not going to go into each, each of them. But what I will say is, if you look across uh, all the waivers in all the states, so there are 40-some waivers in the states, um, ours is by far the most comprehensive. Um, and I, I would argue, not only comprehensive, but we look at things like social emotional learning and we look at growth in a more meaningful way, we look at high school readiness way. We've innovated in a way that no other uh, state came close to. And what I will say is, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think when districts lead, um, closer to the ground of learning, you're going to get a different outcome. And I actually think that's a positive thing. And I think the state of California thinks that's a positive thing, which is why we're moving towards local control. And this is an embodiment of sort of that, that, that movement. Um, and I think has a lot to also not only help us get better, but there's learning for the state back in how they can think about accountability down the road. And I'll talk about that in a moment. This is just a, a, a look at our report card that's coming out now with every school in our district uh, uh, gets one and sort of shows you how you're doing across all the measures. The state obviously is grappling with this notion of how to report on accountability. This is our solution. Uh, I don't think it's right or wrong. It's just one way to look at it. Uh, but the idea is on a singular page, there's actually two pages. It gives you an idea of how your school is doing on the multiple metrics. We actually do index our numbers, which has been a, a point of contention at the state, although we don't lead with a single number. We have it, but we, we, we sort of devalue it. But we do uh, value uh, indexing writ large, which is to say, across all our measures, across uh, academic achievement, chronic absenteeism, uh, culture and climate, family surveys, we, uh, we sort of give you your overall, so your EL redesignation rate, the school was 21% redesignated, uh, and then 16% uh, this year, so they lost 5%, they went down 5%. Uh, that shows them moving down, but also gives them a five out of 10. And five out of 10 means we actually index them compared to every other school in our network. 
um, and they are right in the middle in terms of achievement. So, you know, another example, you look at high school readiness indicator, and I can explain that later what that is, but um, they're at a 42%, 42% of their kids are leaving this middle school, high school ready. What does that really mean? Where, where does that put me? And what it actually says is relative to every other middle school in the state, they're doing quite, quite well. So this gives principals and teachers more than just a single number of where you are, an idea of where that puts you. And what it does also by highlighting green and then red here, it may give you as a staff leadership the ability to sort of say, here's where we ought to be thinking about our focus. So then gives you this overall view across all these measures, how you're doing in a snapshot, and then on the next page, takes a look at that from the from, from a achievement gap perspective. So looks at subgroups as a result. Uh, and what we've done here is we've, we've said that your overall metric, and then we look at your lowest performing ethnic subgroup. The reason we did that was for many schools, if we listed every single subgroup, it would go over, it would be five, six, seven pages long. And we wanted an overview. So we said, here's your biggest problem, the, the subgroup that is the lowest performing. And you can see in this case, on math, it's African American, but on, uh, on, on, on ELA, it's actually Hispanic Latino in this middle school. Um, and we give a full report to the school so they can go further on and see each individual subgroup. But as you see, this is a school that might look not bad from the perspective of overall, but when you look at their subgroups, there's lots to work on. And there's lots to work on. Again, I want to remind you, when you look at red, that means relative to every other middle school in our, so it's not just a random thing. It's relative to schools we, you will find green every, in all of these things. So not only do you know here's an area, so then, you know, Growth mindset is an area where particularly we need to pay attention to, but you will find a school that looks like you with high growth mindset and allows us to sort of pair, find each other, and learn from each other. And I would argue that is the real power of this system is actually connecting people and building a collaborative environment to build capacity and learn from each other. So that is, um, this was sort of a, the final of our thing, and we are now sort of evolving as, as organizations do to what we call core 3.0. So core 1.0, if you will, was the notion we first got together and we first were a learning collaborative. And really it was ultimately about best practice sharing um, and a little bit of uh, dog and pony show. So folks would get together, they'd say, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And it wasn't much more than that. And we took some learning back, but it really didn't go deep into our system. Core 2.0 was under our waiver. And really, I would argue that the real huge benefit of the waiver was creating that, that system of whether or not that's our accountability model, we believe it's the right model to how you know whether a school is doing the right things to make sure every child is college and career ready. So that the indicators we're going to pay attention to, regardless of what the state and federal accountability model is that we think matters to kids. Collectively designing that, collectively committing to that, and then creating, most importantly, a data system to allow us to learn from each other and intervention strategies to, to what to do about these schools um, is the legacy of sort of our waiver. Now that the waiver is gone, we're, gonna, we're focusing on what we're calling core 3.0. And the idea here is that we think there's an opportunity now to really go deep together as a collaborative into a shared problem of practice. And what I will tell you is when we started with Core 1.0, this wouldn't have been possible because what we were clear on is we, we're not going to implement together. We're going to learn from each other, but no more than that. I think over years, uh, we built a trust level with each other. The districts have got to know each other, and they, they, they built relationships with each other, and that has allowed them to be more honest and more vulnerable at what is and is not working, and has allowed us to set up what we're calling Core 3.0, which is to create a singular problem of practice and deeply go in it together to see if we can get a solution. So we went to the superintendents and we sort of said, what are the areas that, that make sense for you to pay attention to? These were the four that jumped out at folks. First of all, I, I went through this accountability model quickly, but I should say it's very, at the heart of our accountability model is equity. So we drop the end size from 100 down to 20. We pay attention to uh, disproportionality about ex uh, uh, suspension expulsion within um, within uh, um, uh, special education, and then really highlight subgroup performance. All of this is about, we believe that is the core focus of what we're trying to accomplish and focus on um, outcomes for kids in biggest need. And so what the superintendent said was they want to look at math achievement, specifically for African American and Latino youth. They want to look at ELA achievement, specifically for African American and Latino youth. They want to look at social emotional learning, and they want to look at grad rates. After that, we sort of honed it down. We met we went to every district. We met with their, uh, their cabinets, their, their leadership teams, and sort of narrowed it down to uh, math was the number one thing across all our districts. And what I will tell you what is worth noting, and we specifically we picked math in four through eight. We're finding, and this is probably not unique, that 
especially as we get to about fourth grade, fourth and fifth grade, the complexity of the common core mathematics is often exceeding what most of our teachers were trained to do in those areas. And so this is a particular concern to our districts so that we need to rethink about how we're supporting teachers in those later elementary grades uh, to, to do mathematics. Uh, and then uh, social emotional learning is obviously a key part, and I'm happy to t I'll talk a little more about that, but this notion of mindsets and efficacy and self-management, we believe matters a lot. So we put these two before the districts and we said, choose one of these two. We thought some would choose one, some would choose the other. It was interesting to me, they all chose mathematics. And I think that ultimately, as much as we care deeply about social emotional learning, it's about moving academic outcomes that really drives our work. They believe deeply that social emotional learning is a driver in what causes low math achievement, it's gonna be something we pay attention to, but this is the area that we've all focused. So we are going to, as a collaborative, focus on improving math proficiency for African American and Latino youth in grades four through eight. Very, very specific. And then we're using improvement science um, that Carnegie Foundation, Tony Brack has done a lot of work on to sort of drive our work. If you know, This notion of PDSA cycles, right? So you plan what you're gonna do, you do the work, you study the results of that, and then you change, you act as a result of what you're learning. But we're not doing that in a classroom. We're gonna be doing classrooms across our network and then building the learning back. So we're sort of uh, on steroids, if you will, getting learning across our entire network and trying to figure out what we can scale across. Uh, and we think the power of all of us doing for these youth in need is gonna be uh, important and powerful. So. The other thing I'll just sort of quickly mention is that part of what we're looking at both in our accountability model and in our, um, and in our, um, in our work in 3.0 is this notion of growth. So uh, we also collect a lot of data that the state does not have. This is a critical part of what we collect that the state does not have yet or maybe at all is growth. And so we don't just look at growth as a cohort growth from how did your school do this year to how did you do next year on SBAC, but we actually look at similar youth. So we have um, things we use sort of, we look at the same growth of test score, were they youth in poverty, were they an English language learner? Was the school uh, intense in the number of kids in poverty in that school? As a result, it gives you a much finer grain indicator of whether that school moved, moved kids farther and faster than a similar school did in our network and allows you to highlight the people who are doing phenomenal work and then learn from them. And so this power of two of looking both at growth as an indicator and working at overall relative achievement and putting them together to sort of see where we want to pay attention and where we can learn from uh, success and where we can spur along where there needs to be better work. One of the interesting things about this you also will find uh, in traditionally high performing suburban schools where they look really good on standardized and always have for years, when you actually look at a growth model like this, they're actually not moving kids as far as they could relative to others. And I think so it'll spur really interesting conversations across the state as people um, adopt this. Uh, and the final thing I'll say is the notion of what we're looking at, I sort of said some of the indicators we look at, that really at heart is a policy decision of what you think matters and what you want to pay attention to for growth. Uh, and so our board spent a lot of time thinking about what we think matters uh, in terms of growth. Um, and then just to I sort of say that we, we think the notion of in 3.0 looking at these different things, we think these are sort of the main drivers that we, we want to pay attention to. So, so much, much learning I talked about, uh, quality of teaching and math, how we're going to provide better supports for our teachers, uh, curriculum and assessments, and then the notion of human capital pipeline. I will tell you this came out of our friends in San Francisco in particular. They just can't fill classrooms, right? So what are we going to do to make sure we have enough high quality teachers in our classrooms? What are we, literary bodies, unfortunately, in San Francisco at this point. So how are we thinking about this together? So I'll sort of sum up by sort of talking about our social emotional learning. And when we talk about social emotional learning, these are the four things we pay attention to. So growth mindset, this notion, the, the belief in oneself that you can learn, self-efficacy, self-management, and social awareness. And collectively, we, th we, we have large reasons to believe that by paying attention to these um, attributes, you will increase achievement along the road. And so we have done the largest survey, uh, as I will often say, in the galaxy of these skills with kids. We have about a half a million kids we've surveyed. And as a result, we're starting to find some really interesting um, information out. So uh, oh, I should also say we look at culture and climate as well of kids. So we actually use mostly the California Healthy Kids Survey with a little bit of differentiation to look at climate of support, knowledge and fairness of rules, safety, and sense of belonging. And by the way, on this, we survey not only students, but the teachers and all staff at a school, and we sur survey um, uh, uh, parents. So I was with uh, at the EdSource convening, which many of you might have been at last week, and I was sitting next to a middle school. Uh, principal from San Francisco at Martin Luther King Middle School. And he, he turns to me, and we were talking about this, he said, what was most important to me was there was this huge disconnect in my school 
between what the parents thought whether it was a safe school, which they did, and the kids thought it was a safe school, which they did not. And he said, to me, that was screamed Boeing or the perceived sense of safety. He said, you know, someone takes my eraser and snaps or takes away from me. I feel a sense of safety that a parent will never have a feeling of. And so it caused him to go back with his staff and have a very different conversation about what safety looks like at his schools. So those are the different ways that these surveys across different measures can really help you as a leader think differently about what you're doing in your school. So in terms of SEL, uh, there's lots of really interesting findings. This one really jumped out at me. And so these are sort of low-achieving math students, high-achieving math students, and then the, the vertical is uh, 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 in terms of SEL skills, right? And so what you see is you see this large disconnect between high-achieving schools and low-achieving in terms of their SEL skills, which is not surprising, somewhat expected. Um, and you see the gap sort of go, and then all these skills sort of really drop as we get in the middle school. By the way, that's a, a, a whole other thing is self-efficacy. You see this huge gap between girls and boys. But when you get to middle school, girls and self-efficacy, it just completely plummets. And I will tell you, I look around and all the women are going, yep. And every time I say that, I hear that again. But these, these results, again, these are, we, we often talk about data as a, uh, as a flashlight, not a hammer. These are flashlight indicators, things that make you wonder and sort of say, what, what do we think about this and how should we address this? So in terms of social awareness, you see it sort of, the gap really get large and then all of a sudden snap clo much closer to close at 11th grade. And we thought, why? That's really weird because it's been going, going, and then all of a sudden 11th grade it's closed. We went back and looked at the data and what we found was the number of low-achieving low kids with low SEL skills, they were gone. They were gone by 11th grade. But low achieving and high SEL skills, they stayed. So what this argues for me, we need to do more work, but argues if we pay attention to these SEL skills, especially in middle and early high school, this could be a huge help for us in keeping kids engaged all the way through the end of the system, right? And then getting them to college. So it's, it, it's findings like this that I think help move the, the general conversation and help us through research to think about how differently, uh, what to do differently in schools. The final thing I'll say, uh, and I think actually one of the is that we have now opened up this data set to any school system in the district or any LA in the state that wants to join us. And it's voluntary. It's your choice. If you think being part of this, and again, we will give you these report cards, and it's interesting from a local conversation, but we think the real power is, provide, is being able to sort of form these consortiums, right? And so these, these systems stepped up and by choice chose to be part of this. We've actually uh, added over 800,000 kids into our data set now. So Sac County, Riverside County, San Bernardino, East Side Alliance, a couple of charter networks. And um, what I will say is we thought about, when we thought about opening this, we thought about, well, CORE could actually run these collaboratives across the state. And what we quickly realized that's not our job. Our job is to work with our eight districts. But we want to encourage other collaboratives to come together, but believe deeply that data matters. So my, my favorite thing I always say is I believe, in my personal opinion, one of the most meaningful reforms in the last decade in education has been the notion of PLCs, have been teachers working together, right? And if you believe that, why shouldn't districts work together? But I was always struck when Rick DeFore would talk about, Rick DeFore sort of the godfather of PLCs, when he, when he wrote and talked about this, he would always say, you can't have a true PLC unless you're gathered around data. Right? Unless you're looking at student achievement, you're not really doing a PLC. This then allows all these local collaborators across the state to have shared data and learn from each other in meaningful and important ways. And so we need leaders to step up like Dave Gordon did in Sacramento to say, I will take that on and I'm gonna work with all my districts. And this is the first time, believe it or not, Sac County's had shared data across all their districts. In East Side Alliance, they have, they have middle and high schools, right? So they, they have non-unified districts. They're using this for articulation. They've never shared data between their middle and high school. Now they are. So they can learn from each other. They can, and the thing I love about that example was I didn't even think about that. It wasn't what we were planning. But then when you make it available, people use it for their own purposes, which is very positive. All right. I really will wrap it. The other to say, we also worked with the Link Learning Alliance to try to bring higher education, to bring sort of career readiness into this. We have, hope to have a career ready indicator in the next few months to a year. And I think it's based on data. And we we'll actually will really have a good understanding of what actually it means to be career ready. And then finally, We've suggested to the state this notion that we can be part of a, of a learning collaborative with the state. So as the state finishes their accountability model, we would then work with them. So the state has their accountability model, which we would adopt uh, metric for metric, exactly the same. And then beyond what they're doing, we would look at other measures. So we may look at SEL. We may look at high school readiness, all the things that we consider important. And then 
we would be a winning collaborative. And what I will say is the notion of using SEL and accountability is quite controversial, and we may be very, very wrong. It might be a very bad idea to, inclu to include that, but we're trying to find that out. We're trying to study it and learn, and then if it, find, if it turns out that it was a bad idea, the state shouldn't do it. But if it turns out it's helpful, the state can then adopt it. And then the most important part of this, as I will turn over to my friend Heather, is that we then, we don't just sort of do this as in theory. We partner with PACE as our research partner, and they are actually doing quantitative and qualitative research in our schools around accountability. So they're saying, if we include SEL skills in your accountability model, they're saying to teachers, what did that do? Did that help you? What did, it, what did you do differently as a result? This notion of actually studying what an accountability model does at the school level should be happening. Uh, it's not happening right now, but I think through this pilot, we can actually show how it can be used effectively to truly be a locally driven continuous learning system. So with that. Thanks, Rick. <clears throat> I think, I think Rick had four finallys. Did you guys have Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so just to, to underscore what's so exciting about this is that in the original core district, there's a million kids represented. In the data collaborative, 800,000 more kids. And at the center of California's idea that local districts and collaboratives of districts are using data to improve, that really relies on a strong research infrastructure. Without this strong re research infrastructure, the districts themselves don't learn from their data as well, and nobody else learns either. And this is a big contribution of our research partnership, is to take what is being learned in districts serving these 1.8 million kids and to make sure everybody's learning from that. So in that spirit, our research partnership is really dually focused on continuous improvement and making <coughs> smarter policy and helping to inform smarter policy. And a key piece of our research partnership is part of the way we do this, or the way we do this, is by engaging with researchers across the state at California Research Universities who partner with PACE and work with PACE as PACE affiliates to do this research. In this way, we're both supporting a smarter use of data across the state, but also supporting a smarter research approach across the state. That researchers are now, when they're working with PACE, going to be focused on continuous improvement and smarter policy as well. Um, the way that we do this is through cycles of research that involve quantitative analysis and qualitative analysis cyclically so that each approach informs the other. Uh, the, the goal of the quantitative analysis is to uncover patterns in data, to explore variation, and to analyze outcomes. But there's a lot that you can't learn just from the quantitative data. And that's why we pair our studies with qualitative work, which is designed to in, under, help us understand imp imp uh, implementation, to highlight promising practices or things, like Rick said, that can be spread, and to explain this variation. So in today's presentation, what I'm going to do in a very quick fashion is to go over all of the research studies that we've produced in this first year. This is the first year of our research partnership with the core districts. And um, we've produced a number of studies that have had a pretty strong impact, both in the core districts themselves and also at the state and federal level in this period where there's so much guidance needed about how to make smart policy. That's been a bit of a stronger focus for us in this year, is helping policymakers get it right by leveraging the core data to help inform decision making. So the pieces of research that I'll talk about are a study where we looked at using chronic absence as an indicator in California's system exploring different subgroup sizes for accountability, identifying schools for improvement, as David mentioned. And we'll also show some preliminary findings about how the measurement around social emotional learning and culture climate, what that tells us about school performance. And finally, I'll discuss the findings from an implementation study, qualitative work in 2015-16, about how the core waiver districts implemented their innovative approach. All of these will be pretty high level, which is why in the back we have printouts for any of you that want to take these reports, uh, with the exception of the SEL and culture climate piece, which is forthcoming at the end of this month. <coughs> but before I get into that, I want to recognize my co-authors. Like I said, PACE and our, the Core PACE Research Partnership is a networked institution. We work with researchers across the state. In the research I'll be presenting today, um, I have co-authors at Stanford, at San Jose State, at UC Irvine, and at USC, and I want to thank them and all of their work here. Um, none, of, none of this work is possible without leveraging the PACE partnership of researchers across the state. 
Um, so the first piece of research that I'm going to go over for you is our, our work in about around including chronic absence as an indicator in California's system. And so just to give you some background about this approach and, and why we took this on, uh, a few months back, this piece came out in March. The state was talking about including chronic absence, but without any data at the state level, they couldn't run models about whether chronic absence actually fit into the accountability system. And this is something we see a lot in policymaking, particularly around data, that sometimes the inability of the data means that the decision makers will say, we can't understand whether or not this is a good idea, so we're not going to put it into law, even if there's a lot of reason to believe that it might be good for kids. So what we did with the core data is a simple policy analysis that showed if and how chronic absence fit into the model that California was producing. And what we found, though many of you are familiar with this, this is California's met matrix looking at improvement on a particular measure versus outcomes. The state wants to use a three-year average and a three-year improvement goal. So what we showed with chronic absence is how CORE's data distributes schools across each of these cells, with the red cells being schools that are concerned and the blue schools being schools that are doing really well. And what we found is that there's about 5% in the concern and about 5% of schools in the excellent, which is what a model like this is designed actually to reflect. Without looking at the data though, we didn't know if it was going to work that way. So that made a case that these measures could be included. Uh, we also showed that three years of data isn't necessary to get something useful because that's another concern that if you don't have the measures yet, you're at least four years out to having something that you can report. And this is another way in which we wanted to be able to show the state that using one year of data and then two and then three as you're building that up is still going to be, it still could be good for kids. And we did show that the one year of core data actually is very closely corresponded with, this, with the schools and this concern group. This, this piece of work had a dramatic impact. We were directly attributed, this work was directly attributed to the state board's decision to include chronic absence into the accountability system. Um, which was something that many advocates and people that fight for kids across the state wanted and was stalled out before we looked at the data to see how it could be integrated. The next piece that we looked at this year was exploring different subsizes for accountability. So um, many of you know, may know that in the ESSA legislation that came out, they said there would be guidance about in the regulations about what subgroup size should be included at the state level. And you know, CORE is, a front, is, a, is on the front lines of this, one of the only places that has used a subgroup size of 20. So we used the CORE data to explore the trade-off between, uh, between subgroup sizes and what, how that changed the way we think about school performance, specifically with subgroups. What we found is that the percent of schools that are reporting different subgroups uh, changes a lot at these different levels of subgroup size. So the blue bars here are the percentage of schools that report a particular group at a subgroup size of 100. The red bars are schools that report a subgroup size between 30 and 100. And then this is schools that report at 20 to 30. So we were both addressing the concern, the, the idea that 100 might be an OK sample size, but also comparing between 30 and 20, 30 being the state's level. What we found is that at 30, the difference between 100 and 30 is tremendous. Um, but the difference between, you know, this is the work of CORE. This is what CORE planned to do, which is a, col a collaboration of the districts. But how did each district implement the work under the waiver? And even more importantly, how did their schools implement the work under the waiver? Because CORE's waiver was really designed to, to support systemic improvement. And it's important to know what that meant when it got down onto the ground. So the three, the three areas that I'll cover briefly are le the lessons that we learned about integrating multiple measures, about supporting struggling schools to improve, and about cross-district collaboration. So the first lesson that we learned is that it's really important to build buy-in across the system. Across the core districts, there was very consistent support for this holistic measurement. And we wanted to figure out why that was. So it's a combination of a few things. First, the staff were intimately involved in the development of the new system. They created the measures. They determined what the measures would be. This is a very important thing in thinking about spreading a, me a local measurement system. It needs to be theirs. <coughs> also, each of the districts did quite a bit of local adaptation. So there was a core system or a central system uh, that each of the districts added to or repackaged to fit it into their local work. Now, this is something that also we should expect to happen when measurement systems like this roll out across the state. 
it's, it, if, it's, if it's done right, if the adaptation is done right, it's not compromising, but it will happen. Uh, the third piece is that the folks in the districts felt that the measures better reflected the realities of their schools. We heard people across all of the districts saying that they've been working on social emotional development in their schools and districts forever. And so the fact that now those measures are being, are reflecting the work of their schools felt really empowering. Um, and there was also consistent support for the growth measure. And this is something I really want to underscore as the state and, and all of you in the room are thinking about how to measure student achievement. In the core districts, the schools wanted credit for what they had contributed to student achievement and felt that the growth measure was a very fair way to be able to do that. The next lesson is that it's really important to focus on building capacity to understand and respond to data. We saw across the core districts wide evidence of, um, of folks using these multiple measures for improvement, including how they allocate resources, um, how they communicate about school performance with various stakeholders across the districts, and how they engage in improvement planning, both at the district level and in the schools. But as you can imagine, there was also wide variation. Not everybody, not every principal, not every person in the district office knew how to make the best use of these measures. And so building a real strong focus on building that capacity is very important. Uh, similarly, it's important to develop a local culture around data use. In the core districts, the idea, the flashlight not a hammer motto actually is very pervasive. People, people reported that to us in our qualitative work quite a bit. Uh, some folks said it's not about putting a red scarlet letter, it's about providing supports. And that was something that culturally had spread very deeply within the districts. Uh, but when we spread this culture across the state, it's easier said than done. Data as a flashlight and not a hammer is a big cultural shift, especially in schools that may have been historically underperforming. We did hear from some principals the idea that the move to multiple measures just means that there's more ways I can look bad now. Um, <laughs> Which, you know, we need to, as we're thinking about the design of these measures, we really need to keep that in mind and think about how we maintain that positive culture around using data for improvement. Finally, we need to be wary of unintended consequences. In the year that we did the re this research, which is last academic year, um, the full system wasn't in place yet, and so the unintended consequences weren't playing out, but there was concern in the districts that we would start to see some of them over time. Uh, so some of the consequences that folks had mentioned are, you know, when you're surveying principal or teach staff in schools, students, parents, uh, if you start to apply that pressure, it's very easy to game surveys. And so we need to be aware of that as a possible consequence. We also heard from principals the concern when you include things like suspension rates, that they might stop suspending kids, even though that might not be what's best for the way that they think about school improvement. Um, so thinking about those unintended consequences is really important, as is thinking about what people are going to do with the data. So we heard a lot of concerns about the snake oil salesman. Somebody that says, you know, comes in all glossy and says, oh, you have low growth mindset, well, just buy my intervention and your growth mindset will skyrocket. And so there is an importance both in the core districts and also across the state that People are going to be hungry for that, for that thing that helps them improve, and we need to provide that to them as, as, a, as a community, because if we don't, then someone will. Um, and then the last section, the, the next section I want to talk about is supporting struggling schools. So in the core districts, Rick didn't talk about this a lot, one of the key pieces of the waiver is that the districts supported the schools that had been identified under the waiver in the bottom 5% and also in, uh, in the next 10%, the priority and focus schools, to improve. And the way that they did this was focusing on peer-to-peer -peer collaboration within the schools, the idea being that Local leaders have, can build the capacity to improve if they work with one another, and also if they're given the right supports and the right frameworks to do that. What we found in this work is that this kind of support was widely favored over sanctions. People in the schools and in the districts said coming off of NCLB, where someone said, here's what you're gonna do to improve, having that agency felt it honored the expertise of our educators, and there was consistent support for that. It wasn't viewed as a punitive thing. Um, the next lesson here is that to maximize learning though, when you're thinking about collaboration, the fit of collaborative partners is very, very important. 
Um, and this, this isn't going to be surprising, I'm sure, to any of you in the room, but across these schools we heard a lot of reports of people saying, we were matched because we have the same student population. And it's true, we have all Asian students, but mine are Hmong and theirs are Chinese, and so we have nothing to learn from one another. Um, and it, was it is hard, I think, for people in schools to see that another school has something that they can learn if the contexts are perceived to be so different. Similarly, there are personality matches as well. You know, a very strong, boisterous leader might have a harder time connecting with a leader that's more interested in distributed leadership. Um, so thinking about those matches is really important. Uh, the next lesson is that it's very important to ensure consistent, high-quality facilitation. These collaborations won't happen without it. People in schools are very busy, and this might not rise to the top. We found that the quality of facilitation was a linchpin in how effective this work seemed to be. Um, the facilitator can help make sure that people are collaborating, make sure they're doing the work that they say they're going to do in cycles, in between meetings, and also can really push their thinking in an important way. And that wasn't consistent across the districts or even within the districts. And that's a really important piece to pay attention to. And finally, it's important to attend to structural challenges in schools that may undermine improvement efforts. And I think this is just a hugely important point that transcends supporting struggling schools, which is that this new theory of local capacity being what drives improvement relies on there being local capacity to develop. And in some of the schools that we did our work, they had turnover in principals every year, or maybe more than every year. Huge turnover in teachers, huge problems with safety. And so the idea that you could go into a community like that and say, now you, working together and using tools of improvement science or collaboration, you can pull yourself up by the bootstraps, didn't ring true in every place, right? We may need, there may be schools where dramatic intervention is what we have to do. Um, <clears throat> and it's just really important to think about that as we think about the design of this work. So the next piece I'll talk about here is district level collaboration to build capacity. In the core districts, they've been working together for six years to build relationships and to build capacity around collaboration that they then take into their districts. Um, and many people believed in this work and very strongly supported it, as they well should, it's their work. Um, but what came across to us very strongly is that it's the relationships that people build in these collaborations that is the most powerful. And so it's, it's not the convenings, although those are important, uh, it's what people do at the convenings that enable you to get someone's cell phone number and be able to text them and say, what did you do to solve a particular problem? Um, so it's very important to build the, build the structures that enable those relationships to be built. Um, the next piece, and it's related, is that you have to get the right people to the table, that building capacity, if the people don't go back and have decision-making power within their organization, means that people are learning, but institutions aren't learning. And so, as in designing this kind of collaboration, the people have to be people who pull levers in their local organizations, and they need to be talking to other people with similar positions. Uh, and the final piece here is that it's very important to select meaningful shared priorities for improvement work. One of the things that we found in our implementation of the waiver year is that people were focusing on implementation of an accountability system. And so a lot of the collaboration they were engaged in was about how to format a particular metric, about how to build a data system, but not necessarily issues of deeper learning. Um, so they weren't coming together and saying, how do we really change our student outcomes? They were coming together and saying, how do we measure student outcomes? And like Rick said, that's kind of a precursor, I think, for getting to the point where you can do this deeper learning. And a large part of why the districts want to engage in this Core 3.0 work. We heard some quotes, one that I love, um, that Core 3.0 is designed to dig into some nitty gritty practice of problems of practice at the district level. So moving from a point where, place where you work on technical problem solving to a place where you're really working on changing your systems and driving student outcomes. Um, so to talk very briefly about our planned, planned research for the year ahead, um, every year we have new questions that follow from the year before. And I want to share with you a bit about what our plan is for the next year and then open it up for questions. So one important piece is that in this first year of the partnership, we've, we've also been building the infrastructure to engage a much larger group of researchers across the state who are affiliated with PACE who can accelerate the learning in the core districts very quickly. 
And the reason why it's important to talk about this specifically is that we have so much to learn in core and from the core data system about a, a lot of huge questions that are unanswered in the field around social emotional learning and culture climate, but also many other questions that are of interest to researchers and that can drive the work of the core districts. So our questions next year on the quantitative side, now that we have two years of data on social emotional learning and culture climate, we can really start to better understand growth in these measures and a school contribution. So with one year of data, we can see what schools are outliers or doing better or worse than expected. But what two years of data help us to do is get at a causal estimate of that so that we can have a better, even better understanding about what school, how schools contribute to this and what are the conditions that, uh, that seem to be driving that. Um, and then PACE research across the state will answer a wide range of questions that are currently under review in the districts uh, around problems of practice and policy. And on the qualitative side, we have a study planned where we'll be going into schools that are outliers on this SEL and culture climate domain and get a better sense of what's going on in those places so that we can then bring that into the improvement science work of the core districts to facilitate and, and help advance their cycles of improvement. And finally, we'll be helping as developmental evaluators to in, uh, facilitate CORE's work as they really dig into these nitty-gritty problems of practice at the district level um, around what it would look like if practice was changing and they were changing their systems in service of these student outcomes. Um, so for more information, I highly encourage you to go to the CORE PACE Research Partnership website. You can email me or Rick or Noah at any time.